Uh, thank you everyone for your patience. Um, we've decided to do a little bit of a, a reshuffle around because I promised you at the start um, that this would be very much your session. So we're just bringing forward the um, Q&A session. Um, we have a great group of uh, people here to answer all your questions. Uh, you know most of them, but I am going to just reintroduce from um, Ian, you've just been hearing from, Andrew Davidson from Team Body Corporate, Annie Nolan, Noosa Council, uh, our Deputy Mayor, Frank Wilkie, and Gareth Duggan. I always go to say Gareth Evans, but that just dates me very much from Home and Energy Company. Um, we did have, uh, and um, we, we don't have a roving mic. We're still sort of being cautious about COVID and all of that. So what I'm going to ask our um, panellists to do is once you've asked your question, they'll repeat the question um, so that everyone can uh, hear it and, um, and, and then be able to respond to that. It'll be up to the panel whether the, they're going to leave it to one or whether they uh, desperately want to um, contribute as a, a group to the issues. Um, what, what I, just to um, kick, kick things off, um, what I might do is just um, flick a question to um, Deputy Mayor Frank um, about that um, little acronym that Ian was um, waving around, EUAs, Environmental Upgrade Agreements, um, which is a very interesting um, finance option that um, has been waiting in the wings in Queensland despite being available in um, three other states for several years. So, Frank, um, maybe just hand the mic to you to give a little bit of what's been happening in that space just recently. Thank you, Vivian. But first, I'd, I'd just like to compliment Ian on his uncanny insights. I mean, how did you know that councillors would be here this morning, fresh from their rooftop solar jacuzzis? <laughs> <laughs> it's uncanny. We've all got separate ones. Um, <laughs> the, um, about a year and a half ago, Zen brought the concept of environmental upgrade agreements to Noosa Council. They explained to us it was a, a, an innovative way of helping property owners, be they owners of commercial or residential properties, overcome initial price barriers or knowledge barriers to getting solar or uh, any sort of environmental upgrades into their properties. And um, the, it involves the uh, property owner being able to access um, loans from a finance company to do the environmental upgrades. Um, and then the debt is linked to the property itself, not the individual, and recovered through rates uh, for an agreed time up to 20 years. Um, we took that. We took a motion to the local government conference that the state government change its legislation to allow councils to do that, to, to make that offering. Uh, it's, it's operating in other uh, states, three, at least three other states, used by 62 other councils. Our staff um, have told me that within 12 months we could have a similar offering here for owners of commercial and residential properties. We, at the local government conference, the state government had already taken uh, advice, perhaps from Zen directly. I don't know whether, I know Zen had met with the minister and had, uh, were looking at amending the legislation to allow environmental upgrades for commercial properties as part of their energy and jobs plan. The motion we took to the local government conference would then just have to be amended slightly to allow it to be extended to residential properties as well. Where We've yet to hear from the LGAQ policy executive as to whether they're going to be advocating uh, on that to the state government, but it would only be a slight change to the legislation to allow it to apply to residential properties as well. Our staff are already investigating ways in which we can make it happen. They say it's very simple. Already they collect the rural fire levy and pass that on to another party. This would involve them collecting part of the rates uh, sorry, the, the loan repayment from the property via the rates 
and passing it on to the finance company. So it's a great way for property owners such as yourselves uh, to get out, get out a large loan to in upgrade your buildings and reap the financial and environmental benefits from that. So, uh, questions from the audience? Yes. Can you outline the um, lower and upper limits of that set? In terms of the amount you can borrow? My understanding is that the finance company will make that decision based on your capacity to pay. For, an, for instance, if it's a large client like Noosa Civic, they may need a, a, a if it's, let's say we're talking about solar, a very large solar array, they certainly have the capacity to re repay that. So that'd be an entirely different limit offered to uh, a household or an individual business. And um, one thing I might um, one thing I might add is that we've um, just recently found out um, uh, because we work closely with our local member Sandy Bolton as well. Um, and Sandy has just put a, a question um, in Parliament to the relevant minister, Minister de Brenny, um, and he's asking her to do the homework as to why they should include the um, residential in it, as, as you do. Um, and, and in fact, our chairperson, Anne Kennedy, is in Victoria uh, this month, she's going to be meeting with the Victorian proponents of this scheme. Uh, they originally started off with commercial. Um, they then amended the legislation to pick up on residential as well. So we will have very solid um, evidence and, and material to put before Minister De Brenny. Um, it, it should be a painless process for um, for the government because it's actually then, um, and it's a painless process for local government because you opt into the scheme as a, as a, a council. You know, you're not forced into offering it or running it. Individual councils make that um, decision to opt in and to give that financial assistance to their residents and businesses. Um, questions with uh, regarding um, uh, did I did I see a question somewhere? Question. So, so is the um, interest for payments on that sort of loan quite high because it's deemed a, an unsecure loan for a, a body corporate as such? My understanding is the interest can often be lower than normal rates because it's it's the council will be involved in collecting it. At, there's, there's less risk involved, and it can be um, amortised over a longer period of time. And secured against the property. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, my question really is to do with batteries and what influence batteries might have on the, the, on the structure of what Ian presented, and whether or not a battery could actually become an ENO. Garrett. Garrett. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Garrett should be. Hi, how are you? So the question was whether batteries can be part of a system, a renewable energy generating system, and whether they're useful, and whether they can um, be part of an embedded network. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So yes, so storage, batteries are essentially energy storage. Uh, and energy storage can take many forms, and people often think of you know, an electrical battery sitting there as being their energy storage. But on a much simpler version of this is hot water. We all have electric hot water, or most of us have electric hot water systems. If we have a tank with that electric hot water system, we have energy storage that goes alongside it. So the average person uses around about two kilowatt hours of energy in hot water per day. If we had four people in a household, that's eight kilowatt hours. If we've got a tank storing eight kilowatt hours of energy, that's more than an $8,000 battery sitting right there as your electric hot water system. So uh, energy storage absolutely should be part of the conversation and in fact uh, anyone doing work on uh, a renewable energy system should be talking about and designing in energy storage as part of the process of working with you. 
Um, load shifting is very important. Uh, there's many locations that will run energy, say for heat pumps and pools, day and night, consistently, using the same amount of energy all day and night. In fact, using a little bit more at night time because it's cold at night. So trying to shift that energy from night into day when you're generating energy by day is a no-brainer, right? If you're making your own energy, use the energy that you're making, don't use their energy. So yeah, energy storage can certainly be designed into, um, into systems. And the second part, whether or not it could actually become, you know, say, a profit-making entity within the, within the overall structure. Yeah, so it, it can add to the savings across the structure. Um, some energy storage, like hot water systems, are very cheap. Other energy storage systems, like electrical batteries, are more expensive and have longer returns on investment. But yes, absolutely, they still add to the revenue and the savings that can be generated through something like this. And when we, and I don't think that that's an important thing, you know, we, we're so used to, um, I'm so used to the fantastic returns that you get from putting on a solar generation system. When you put on something like an electrical battery, uh, it's a slower return, but it's not, doesn't mean that it's not a, a good result. When you're a body corporate and you actually getting, making money, that's a, that's a good thing, right? Yeah. Okay, gentlemen, down the front and then we'll just staying on the battery uh, issue, um, for a community scheme where properties are up, uh, built very, very close to each other in, in, um, in uh, uh, groups and whatever, are there any issues around um, Australian standards for, for batteries uh, in properties? Um, and, uh, and also, can you give us a bit of an idea on the commerciality of where battery technology is now in yeah, absolutely. So we are regulated under Australian and New Zealand electrical standards uh, and there's very, very high electrical safety standards required when installing a battery system, um, which are mostly uh, around where they can be located, fireproofing of those batteries to make sure that if they happen to have electrical runaway, thermal runaway, that they don't cause a fire. So yes, these are considerations. Um, they can be incorporated. Batteries are uh, getting better. They're getting uh, electrical batteries, we're now talking about, um, are getting smaller. Um, in fact, we've got a battery that's 660 millimetres wide, 330 millimetres deep, and less than a metre high, storing 20 kilowatt hours of energy. So that's about as much as most households would use in a day, um, which is pretty decent, right? So it's not a massive space that it's taking up. Uh, and, and the technologies are getting um, are advancing and continuing to grow. Um, there's commercially available technologies available right now. Uh, we don't have to wait. We can install batteries into a system right now if we choose to. But first, before we install an electrical battery, we should be looking at all of those uh, load shifting opportunities, thermal batteries, smart controllers, things that shift energy from nighttime into daytime so that we don't have to store it to supply that energy at nighttime. That's the smartest money you spend in shifting energy from here into here. as well but uh, uh, the question was um, have we done any work on uh, looking at uh, EV charges uh, and their commerciality and uh, where we could put them if we don't have uh, enough space to put a charger um, for each lot for example well, uh, if you're looking at communal right so unfortunately um, um, because I talk too much. Uh, we ran out of a bit of time for Gareth to, to, to be talking about these issues and they are very pertinent. They're sort of Solar 103 as opposed to Solar 102. Um, as, as feed-in tariffs, and as, and 
once once we've done what Gareth suggests, which is shifting our, our usage from nighttime to daytime wherever we can, we're still going to end up with people who get up in the morning and have a shower and, and, and turn on the TV and, and the toaster and the kettle. And the same when they come home from work. There are going to be non-solar hours usage. First thing to do is try and put them into solar hours. If we can't do that, what do we do next? Um, if we've still got excess, EV chargers are a perfect thing to have. Um, Tesla will give you a free EV charger at your scheme um, so that you can uh, have in your uh, visitor's car park, you can have an EV charger whereby you let uh, your um, guests or residents charge there for nothing. Tesla won't charge you. If you don't charge them, they won't charge you. If you charge the people who are, being, who are doing the charging, they'll charge you one cent per kilowatt hour, which is nothing. So you can use that excess that you're uh, using. Uh, Gareth? Just, just a comment on that space as well. It's evolving very quickly and there are some challenges with it around capability particularly uh, in some of the larger schemes. I mean, uh, we've seen situations where trickle-down EV chargers have gone into schemes. I really question uh, the value of that type of thing, uh, and, and in particular, moves into common property. There's a lot of complexity around some of the challenges with that. Uh, it's not a simple thing. Uh, it, it certainly needs external expertise. I think what solar is one thing. There's a whole lot of other environmental initiatives uh, that are much broader, including EV chargers, water and the likes that uh, I think the industry is trying to get its head around very quickly, uh, in particular the legalities of all of that. And, and if I can just add, um, Tourism Noosa has um, fairly recently put together a collation of all the properties in Noosa that are offering electric vehicle charging um, arrangements for their guests. Um, I was really surprised by the number that's um, already in place. Um, and, and the other thing I would add is that while we're talking about EV charges as the car drawing power from the, the property or from the grid. Um, the other thing that's, that's happening right now is the reverse. The car as the battery storage. So the capacity for vehicle, they call it vehicle to grid, vehicle to home, where the, where the vehicle, um, trans, it's, a, it's a, it's a bloody grid, big battery in a car. Um, which um, is, is probably um, probably no more than about 12 months away. They keep sort of working on the standards. The Nissan Leaf and the Mitsubishi Outlander were the ones that I know about that already have this capability. Um, and but you know the, the newer models coming on uh, will also be providing it. So that's part of that bigger picture about how. This whole space is is changing so rapidly, and um, it, it, that that issue of power for EVs, particularly for strata, um, you know, at home, I plug mine into the three pin point. Um, not so easy when when you've got a, a block of units to do that. Yeah, it's a really good question, and it's something that is coming. It's something that you have to prepare for. Uh, it, it inevitably people are going to be driving electric vehicles and not petrol vehicles. Yes, it is. It is um, <laughs> it's inevitable, and so you need to obviously um, start thinking, knowing that that's coming, planning for that, thinking about the meterboard upgrades that perhaps need to occur. What would be the implications of having people coming in and putting in a fast charger, and all of a sudden having this amount of energy being drawn from your site? Uh, in one moment, what would happen? Would, the, would it melt? Would the cables melt? Would the transformer blow up and fizz out the front? What would happen? So these are things that, um, that do need to be considered and you need to start planning for, for sure. And we need to do this intelligently. Should we be having people come home and charging at seven o'clock at night? I think that'd be a disaster, personally. 
think that this is not the right way. And uh, I've put up a graphic here that's showing a smart EV charger. So uh, the red energy is energy that's being consumed on site, the green energy is solar production on site. Uh, and you can see where the red and the energy sort of crosses over and becomes this murky green use energy. The murky green is the good energy, we love that energy. That's energy that's being used during solar hours and it's energy that's coming from your own generation system. The reason that the murky energy is following the shape of the, uh, the red energy that's there is because it's a smart EV charger that's there. A car's been plugged in and the charger is charging at the rate of available solar power. So it's going up and down and up and down depending on how much energy generation is available from the solar system. So these types of charges are going to become really important in this picture where you're not having that massive demand on the grid. You're actually supplying that energy in-house. It's not costing you a lot of money. It's very cheap. All of a sudden, you're raising money for the body corporate because now this energy is coming from you instead of the petrol station. So it's another form of revenue. And, uh, and, yeah, and, it, and, and perhaps avoid costly upgrades to the switchboards. Um, as far as common power is concerned, that was the other question. Uh, yes, it is possible to install EV chargers on the common power and it's now possible to put EV chargers in that allow you to plug a pin into. So you can type your pin in, which then gets billed to your rooms. Okay, so that's, that's one um, solution for properties that don't have their own meters or don't have a location to charge that's not off a common power. But otherwise, um, alternatively, it may be that you've got a carport and that carport has the ability to draw power from your room particularly and perhaps the system that's on your roof as well. So it could be linked in that way. There's lo lots of different ways of doing this and, and certainly worth starting to explore them. Gareth? Just as a uh, real live uh, example as well, our business invested in a 30 kilowatt system in solar when we relaunched last year and the carbon savings thus far have been 48,000 kilograms or 2,400 trees in, in just a commercial lot down there in Wyber Road. So uh, that's, that's come up today on my uh, home and energy, here's the plug for you Gareth, um, software on a real live example. I might just take the opportunity as well to uh, thank a number of my colleagues here from other uh, bodies corporate who've come up and joined, some from the Noosa Shire and some from Sunshine Coast. Um, somebody did ask me where's this all going from here from a ripple effect. I wear a couple of hats here, not only as uh, somebody who has supported this initiative right from the start but uh, I'm also on the uh, Strata Community Association for Queensland board and uh, we're, we're really wanting to see what we can do to expand this beyond Noosa uh, down onto the, into the Sunshine Coast and we've got some of our clients here today but more importantly across uh, Queensland and education certainly something that the strata industry is very passionate about. Um, it is one of the pillars of the Strata Community Association to ensure that uh, the organisation is environmentally uh, responsible, is economically viable, and is also a great uh, player in the community. So it will be something that we're looking at from uh, a webinar point of view, and it may be an opportunity for uh, this type of discussion or conversation to take place at one of our strata conferences. Any other questions? Yes, sir. The new complexes, the big new complexes that are happening back at like this, is council got a role when they starting in now to actually have solar put on them straight away? We really have very little power under the Planning Act to mandate uh, that those sort of measures go on new developments. 
we did try through when in bringing in the Noosa Plan 2020, we did put it to the state that we would be able to do that. Uh, water and energy efficient measures be attached to new dwellings, but that was not permitted. But we're going to have another crack at it. It makes a lot of sense. Do you want to add anything to that, Annie? Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, the other thing that's just happened is the um, construction code, the building construction code, has just been up updated as well, and that's now requiring um, all new housing to be up to seven star green star. So the more that we can actually lobby those types of um, bodies to actually include energy efficiencies right from the get go, and also that it's a requirement for solar. Um, as part of the integral part of the design, the more that we can, we'll get to see these opportunities because you know something like that to have an embedded network with solar on some of those huge properties would be fantastic. But unfortunately, council in itself can't actually mandate, mandate that. Okay. Just to add to that, one of the other motions that we took to the LGAQ conference was that the the new national building code be adopted. It's it's a non-mandatory code uh, currently, but we'd like that. The, the Queensland Building Code, which um, which holds sway in Queensland to adopt the, the same principles as the National Building Code. Uh, I think Stuart, did you have your hand up? I'm interested in, sorry, yeah. I'm interested in the graph that Gareth has put up. Did you use the hands device in, in uh, obtaining the data, like the load data or the consumption generation data, so you get real time? Yeah, so there's um, various meters that can be installed with installations. Some meters come with the solar inverters themselves uh, that, that um, allow the inverter to make real-time decisions as to uh, the energy that it should be producing or should not be producing. Uh, in this case, we've got a graph with um, a system that has a smart EV charger. So the EV charger needs to make intelligent decisions. The it has a battery on there, which is that blue line down the bottom, and we can see the battery discharging to meet the, the loads overnight, and then charging up again. Um, the, and, and so this, this is something that comes from the inverter in this situation. There's also third party meters that we can install and do install on site. Ian mentioned one of those meters uh, in one of these graphs where he was showing that a, a privately owned meter, not owned by the electricity retailers, is installed so that the body corporate's able to build for the energy that's being used uh, on site. So yes, there's, there's lots of um, different devices that we can and do use. Yes, up the back. Uh, what do you call for a question? If, say you've got a block of eight units and two people object to putting solar on the roof, uh, the other option is, say, three are interested, and the others are, and one or two of them just want to object to everything which happens. What happens? Well, common property. If, if it's common property, if it's common property, the body corporate has the right to install the solar. Uh, what it doesn't have the right to do is impose a supply to an individual. That's so the body corporate can do what it likes as long as it's passed by you know the appropriate resolution at a general meeting to insert. Slight objection, it's all over. No, it, not, not necessarily. No, it, it's on the top, it's on the bell, the majority of those. Depends who owns the, what sort of, uh, are we talking if the body corporate owns the roof there? If the body corporate owns the roof, it's not a resolution without dissent. So it's not a 100% resolution. And, okay? So that's how that would be addressed. Because very, very hard to get a resolution without dissent across in anything these days unless there's uh, a lot of marketing within the body corporate. Now, there's a gentleman who had the hand up. I'm sorry. Yeah, this question might be to Ian Wright. Would you be able to describe briefly how the grid or transmission systems actually managed nationally? 
<laughs> you're, I, think, I think you're wrong there. No, you, I don't think Ian Wright knows the total workings of uh, Energex's distribution grid um, and how long have you got. Um, uh, generators create power. It goes where it's needed. It goes via transformers. Transformers then go to your green box outside your house and then into your meter. Um, when, if we want to talk about the whole market, no, we haven't got time to do that, nor do I have the, uh, the, the, the best experience of it. All I can say is that, um, uh, that people, uh, retailers, buy electricity from the market, and it is a market. The spot prices go up and down all the time. They either buy it there and then and have to pay whatever the market price is, which is what caused uh, a lot of problems in June, or they uh, sign contracts purchasing an amount of electricity over the next year, two years, three years. So that's how they can guarantee what their rates are going to be for a period of time. Is that getting anywhere near to the answer you were hoping for? No. No, I didn't think it would be. <laughs> the only reason I brought it up that we had six or seven days of no solar, actually. And I thought, geez, I'm glad we've got the grid. I wonder who managed it. I, I, I do think that that's one we're going to have to part, perhaps for a, a, a larger discussion about how that grid uh, works. Or oh, whether it uh, does or doesn't oh, work. Oh, indeed, indeed. Um, I'm going to, sorry, I think I'll close the session for questions. We promised that we, you know, keep, keep to time. Um, first of all, I would like you to thank our uh, speakers and our panellists um, um, and a, a particular big thank you to Ian um, who not only today but behind the scenes has been working to put this program together so please join with me thank you, Ian. I would like to thank everyone who's come along today uh, as I said at the beginning, um, we really appreciate you taking time out of what these days are very busy days. They're often challenging if you're looking for staff for your business. <laughs> um, so taking that time and the interest that you've shown in an issue which obviously is, is close to our hearts and, and we want to make it close to everyone's hearts. Um, but, but thank you. So give yourselves a pat on the back. As I said, um, we have videoed um, this session. The wonderful Duncan McQueen um, will be putting that in an order that links with the slide presentation as well. Um, but if you do want um, quick access to the slide presentation, please let me know and um, I'll get that out to you um, and a reason, a pretty quick, pretty quick turnaround. Finally, just thank you to um, Mark and his team from the J and from Council for sponsoring the availability of this venue. It's a terrific community resource. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Mark.